thanks everyone for joining the first ever virtual Iowa Art Summit and for attending this lightning round session called Programming During a Pandemic, Innovation in the Performing Arts. My name is Lindsay Keast and I am the Arts Program Coordinator for the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council is a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs and we are your state arts agency and pleased to offer this session at the Iowa Arts Summit. This lightning round will give you a taste of some of the innovative programming created by performing arts organizations from across the state. The ideas highlighted are just a sample of the incredible contributions from Iowa arts organizations in response to the pandemic. We hope these ideas will leave you with additional tools and a renewed sense of inspiration to strengthen your community through the arts. Speakers for today include Scott Cornwell and Susan Price of Smokestack in Dubuque, Michaela Freiberger of Dubuque Main Street, David Kilpatrick of the Des Moines Community Playhouse, Travis Morgan of Sioux City Symphony Orchestra, and Erica Overturf of American Midwest Ballet. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Please note that all Iowa Art Summit sessions are being recorded and will be archived on Google Drive. We will plan to email that out to everyone around August 17th, so you'll have all the recordings and anything else that speakers want to share with you. The speakers for the session will be able to address questions at the end of the session. So if you have a question, feel free, feel free to throw it in the chat box or the Q&A, and we will address those at the end of the session, as many as we can get to. Um, please also feel free to use the chat or Q&A if you're experiencing technical difficulties. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. So to kick off this lightning round, we have Scott Cornwell, Susan Price, and Michaela Freiberger of Dubuque whose organizations partnered to host outdoor rooftop music concerts in Dubuque. Susan Price and Scott Cornwell are the hands-on creators of Smokestack, a three-story arts and culture venue in Dubuque that offers a range of art, entertainment, and nightlife. The husband and wife team moved from New York City to Dubuque in 2013, prompted only by a brief visit six months earlier and the desire to save the historic Smokestack property. Bit by bit, they transformed the derelict warehouse into a recording studio and a popular destination for concerts, drag shows, art exhibitions, independent theater, rooftop raves, Latin club nights, bluegrass jams, and much more. Michaela has been the program specialist at Dubuque Main Street since 2016 and works with many community partners on events and other strategic community initiatives. From rejuvenating a community festival to filling vacant storefronts with small businesses, Michaela has a passion to celebrate the vibrancy of her hometown and the Downtown Dubuque Cultural Corridor. Um, Susan, Scott, and Michaela, I will hand it off to you. Well, um, thank you very much for having us. She said it all. I mean, really. Um, <laughs> well, you know, Scott and I, we're kind of creative people. We own a, for, you know, Smokestack is a for-profit arts and culture venue. And, you know, we're creative and we, you know, created Smokestack, and Scott once said that uh, we built the, or building the plane as we, fl uh, building the airplane as we fly it, and uh, that's kind of what we do. Um, so when we had, you know, when, when we were shut down as a venue due to the pandemic, um, you know, we, we changed, we switched gears immediately. Um, and one of the ideas that Scott had had for a long time was a rooftop concert. Uh, we'd already done rooftop, we were already doing rooftop concerts, uh, but he was talking more about a festival. Um, and you know, we, there's the iconic imagery of the Beatles on the rooftop at Apple Studios. You know, that is kind of collective consciousness um, for all of us. And we all know that, but- We've been doing shows on the rooftop. Our, our venue is a three-story venue. We do, we have a main stage downstairs, gallery on the second floor, and then we've got two beautiful rooftop spaces up on what would be the third floor. And directly across the street is the uh, county, county courthouse parking lot, which gives a very large open area right across the street from our roof. So as Susan mentioned, I had the idea a long time ago about putting a band on the roof and people could be in the parking lot and watching the band, but we never really got to doing that. And we'd been hosting shows on the roof, but the audience was on the roof with the band. But then with the advent of the pandemic and whatnot, the virus, it, we didn't feel that that was even appropriate anymore. We didn't feel good about having it out. Even though it was an outdoor show, people would tend to congregate near the stage. There were always clusters of people and it was not you know, the, the kind of uh, thing we wanted to be doing at this point. So then I thought, you know, maybe we should go back to the idea 
of having the band on the roof and having the audience across the street in the parking lot, which seemed like a much better way to do it. And so then we started playing with that idea. At first, we were just going to do with my band, the Alamatics, which is a bluegrass band, just do a drive-in concert for my bluegrass band. But then once it started to come together, we got so excited about it. We thought, well, let's invite more bands. Let's open this up and let's have people participate. Yeah. And also another motivating factor for this show was the fact that there are so many musicians in the area that suddenly had lost their means of support. And really a crucial... Um, inventory stream for these people was doing the live performance and all the performance venues were shut down so we thought let's do a benefit and people can contribute people can donate and the proceeds will go to the local musicians yeah that was a really big component when we started it we went immediately to the health department with the idea that the parking lot is ideal because it's already divided into individual spaces um, and the great thing about being on the roof, the performers are on the roof, really the optimum listening and viewing spot is about 150 feet out it's in the middle of the parking lot. So you don't have any, even if you put a stage on the ground at an outside performance, people tend to congregate at the stage. Yeah. Here, coming up next to the building doesn't help. Your best viewing is out in the middle of the parking lot, and that's where people would set themselves up. All the way out there, you'd see groups of people or individuals setting up their chairs or tailgating or parking 200 feet out and enjoying the music. Yeah, so our first one back in, in late May was 20 different acts. And we were able to raise $1,400 on donations alone to be distributed between 35 performers. Um, it was a very successful event. We knew as a venue that we were not going to make money. Um, we knew that it was going to be a loss, um, but we were fortunate enough to be one of the recipients of the Iowa Economic Development Authority's uh, disaster grant, and we thought one usage of, of some of the money could be to give back to the community in this way and give performers a chance to make even a little bit. So it was very effective for that, uh, and it gave, that, that funding gave us the confidence uh, and a little cushion, uh, which enabled it. And again, we, as Susan mentioned, we uh, had actually 20 acts. We had 35 performers in all. The logistics were pretty incredible. Yes. But we managed, we wanted, we didn't want anyone to feel left out. It was going to be such a yeah. fun thing. Yeah. And the performers just loved it. The audience was like, oh, this is great. You know, sitting here tailgating. We've got plenty of distance, but we can see and hear fine. We put speakers on the roof and speakers on the, on the ground. Yeah. So the sound was fantastic. Yeah. And then we timed the thing so that we scheduled it absolutely so that everyone had a 25 minute set. We asked people to rehearse their set. I warned them, I'm gonna cut the PA at 25 minutes, which actually everyone is so punctual, I didn't get to do, but that was a crucial element yeah. of it. Having the clock on stage and actually timing all the performances. Absolutely, but with that many acts, we did all acoustic. Um, we have, we're fortunate to have on site our audio engineers recording studio, Asylum Recording. Uh, and we have several PAs between us. So we, we had enough equipment as a venue uh, and a recording studio to create the amount and sound projection that was necessary for this project. Um, so it was very successful. Um, and it was so successful we collaborated that, we, with that we did it again with Dubuque Main Street. Michaela Freiberger was there. and. She collaborated with us and on the second one and Dubuque Main Street, um, we were able to have a little bit of a bigger thing uh, on the second go round. We did, uh, we actually sold alcohol. The first one we had a dry event. Um, and the second one was, we did sell some alcohol and it and we was, had food trucks as well. Food trucks came in. Closed off a block of 7th Street. It was like a block party. It was a whole community thing, which is so crucial in this time people and we are doing live streaming and that's a wonderful wonderful thing but people really miss the interaction the live performance the community the spirit of the community the totally. supporting the arts in the community as we all know is so crucial to the vibrancy of a downtown community so that people just aren't isolated yeah to add to that um you know we we between smokestock and dubuque main street 
um, felt that we could have conversations with our community partners at the courthouse and with the city. Um, you know, Dubuque Main Street has been known to close off a couple streets in the last couple of months, whether it's our outdoor dining or half of a block with smokestack to put tables so people are, you know, socially distanced and spaced out within the food truck area and so they can consume some beverages. And I would say uh, we have a mask mandate for our upcoming August 22nd one, but that's not going to be an issue for the crowd that attracts, you know, to, to come to this live music. You know, Scott and Susan mentioned people are craving this and they want to participate in this. And so we, we felt that you know, the, the type of crowd that we've established a connection with between both of our organizations understood that right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we need to be together to, um, you know, socially distance and, and just be together to celebrate the vibrancy in downtown. Thank you, Nicole. And, and, and so um, fortunately, Scott, and Susan and I have had continuing conversations. And so uh, we just have one meeting on Monday, but we foresee that not being a challenge. As I mentioned, you know, masks are something that Dubuque is now going to have as mandatory. And we didn't have any issues at our last concert as we had a board of health member on site who is handing out free masks. So um, very strategically, our conversations were, how can we involve um, members of the community who, you know, are advocating for safe, you know, distancing and socially um, being responsible while gathering for this event. And, um, you know, that education piece really added a nice little touch to our um, nice little collaboration. And it allowed us to continue to gain grace with those who are elected officials in our area to be able to move forward and do this again. And uh, so we are looking forward to, on August 22nd, hosting another rooftop concert. And um, I'll let Scott and Susan kind of talk about uh, their perspective um, a little bit. And then I know we're getting kind of close on time, but I'll kind of go through some of the pictures here too in the background. So you can kind of see how we had the table socially distanced, um, kind of what the event space looked like for that second round. This was, uh, if I can say, the logistics of both concerts, this is an all-day affair um, between us, the musicians, the audio engineers, between our limited staff. Uh, Michaela killed it, if I can say. Um, amazing to work with you, Michaela, always. Um, you know, so it was, it, it is a very big, big event but is very worthwhile. Uh, it doesn't see, you don't see that there are a lot of people here, but there are people in cars. There are people, you know, outside of cars, the people walking around here and there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. and it's a growing event as well. You know, nationwide mm -hmm. now, drive-in concerts are happening more and more. Um, so it's nice but to doing it on the rooftop, you can see in this shot here, that's where the band was actually up on the roof. And a lot of the people were located where this photographer is standing. Yeah. But you could hear fine. You yeah. could hear perfectly and you could see that the band mm -hmm. was up there and there's no mm -hmm. impulse to move in any closer. You're fine a hundred feet out. Yep. So we've had conversations as an organization about encouraging other events uh, coordinators that have spaces that are, you know, kind of like a plateau and then they have a parking lot that cars can park in um, and project either sound or they can project an opportunity uh, to have a movie. So that really gives kind of that drive-in feel. Um, but at the same point, all of our messaging was really crucial. Um, to have this successful event. And that was, you know, bring your mask, bring your lawn chairs, socially distance and space out. Um, come enjoy a cold beverage, eat some really good local, you know, made food. And I know we're really getting close on time, um, but from the Dubuque Main Street perspective, it's really integral to have already built some connections with some community partners as we have with the smokestack. And to tap into those right now, 
and to see what you can do creatively to move forward, um, especially to unite your community together. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, when, when you, McKenna and I were talking last week about it, one of our, my thoughts was, you know, desperate times calls for, call for desperate measures, but you have to think about creative engagement, um, how you can stay relevant, um, how you can still deliver in a way that people understand. And how we can provide live performance. It's important. It's such a crucial thing for people's well-being and the community. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, Scott, and Michaela for that. Um, a reminder to continue to submit your questions through the Q&A and or the chat, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, our next speaker is David Kilpatrick of the Des Moines Community Playhouse. Since his arrival at the organization in 2017, David has led the Playhouse's 100th anniversary celebration, a major construction project, and several stage productions, including Mamma Mia, Newsies, and most recently, Rounding Third, for the company's first live theater drive-in, which is the project he's here to share with us today. David, I'll let you take it away. Well, good morning. My screen is shared properly, is that correct? Correct. It looks great. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so very much for this opportunity to share and talk about because um, as Susan and Scott and, and Kayla talked about is the live is so important and the present is so important. So, of course, we all, we all face the same challenge. Oh, well, there we go. We all faced um, the same challenges. So what I'm going to talk about is the challenges I saw, the inspiration for our solution, the planning that went into it, and then some of the application and the practice of what we had. Um, so first of all, of course, we know the challenge is people wanting to see performing arts, wanting to see theater in some fashion, but yet we still had to um, make sure we kept everybody safe, um, both our audiences and our performers. I mean, it, it's unlike certain scenarios where the performers are in their individual rooms in a live theater environment or in a live performance environment, they're kind of standing next to each other. Um, and then, of course, the potential for income became important to us. One of our quick research projects told us that outdoor activities was really going to be the only way that people were going to even come close to feeling safe in the, this summer. Um, and so that, that started it. So I said, well, let's start thinking. Let's be creative. And I knew outdoor theater had been done before, but let's say, you know, what could we do? And um, at the time, I happened to be driving past a high school where my daughter goes to, and I saw the ball fields. And I said to myself, hey, what about some sort of found space, some sort of um, opportunity that's not traditionally theater, but still could meet some of the needs of, of keeping our audience safe, you know, in the, in the stadium and keeping our performers safe. And I knew that there was a, a script called Rounding Third that involved two little league coaches. And so there's no intimacy between them because they don't really like each other. So I knew I could keep do a play with distance and let's do it in this found space, this ball field, and that would be so cool. But then we began to start thinking about it and says, well, the governor at the time had not released ball fields. They had started talking about releasing drive-in theaters you know, the movie houses, and, but not the ball fields. And then I got to saying, well, if they're going to be doing, releasing the ball field so we could do a play, then the ball field will probably want to be occupied by the ball players. And so it was not necessarily going to be the best place for us to try and do a play. So let's, let's look, but keeping that concept, that idea, a little bit of a found space. So that actually brought us to our own parking lot at the theater. And of course, fortunately, like others, Google Earth is such a wonderful place to uh, explore some ideas and just concepts. Very cheaply, I could draw these little square boxes and lay out a parking lot. And so we were going to put our stage, the big blue square there, on, on the grass. And we were going to have the cars put in their parking spots and everybody be safe. We could get, you know, six feet away each other and, and just really c keep protected. But then creatively, we're like, well, there's a challenge with the sun and there's a challenge with the schedule and whatnot. So, so, and we're running into not very many cars. That's really kind of, there's a lot of, lot of wasted space there. So we moved things on and said, well, what if we made our stage a little closer? We brought some cars a little closer and we tried to make everybody a little more intimate, still being safe, of course. And then we realized we were dealing in a scenario of um, 
the sun still being an annoyance to us because we knew this was an outdoor venue. So we actually said, well, what if we ignored the parking positions and just really created our own parking positions and moved the stage in such a way that we had access to electricity? And so that's what gave us the final opportunity there was that scenario. And again, notice, these are just ideas. We're just dreaming on pieces of paper. We're not trying to build anything at the time. But this gave us a great direction to go, which gave us the more formal layout of our parking structure. And this is just an example of some of the planning that went into place. Um, and so I, that gave us, okay, this is doable. We can make this happen. What you're looking at here is an example of an official parking lot that we laid out. And we put in the extra squares to indicate where we could stick more people if we needed to. Um, what the round ones indicated lawn chairs if they wanted to sit in the grass. And we've had several people who like to do that. Um, the X's were indicated parking spots that may not be get, easily get to. Um, so let's not you know, use those first. Um, so that's, that was what we came up with. And so um, then the planning continued how we're going to do traffic flow and where we're going to, and this was just an example of where we laid out where we were going to have volunteer ushers um, and what the traffic pattern was really going to be, what signage we needed, what processes we wanted to go to keep our audience safe. And you'll notice that the, the little um, you know, comedy tragedy mask indicated where the stage was. So this just gave us a, a, an understanding, again, all without cost, just merely some thinking and planning and working about everything that was possible that we could worry about, that we could think about. And that's, that gave us the confidence to say, yes, this is doable. So what did we end up doing? We ended up creating a little season for our drive-in theater. Um, we picked three plays. The plays were based on the idea of the love letters is a simple play, two people sitting side by side reading um, the letters that they wrote to each other from when they were there eight years old to when they were about 50 years old. So very minimal movement, no kissing, no, no intimacy required whatsoever. And uh, yet we could then have our, um, we could focus on making sure the audience was kept safe because it was really easy to keep our performers safe. Rounding third was of course the inspiration for this whole entire concept. And then the roommate was a bit more of a contemporary play. We said, well, let's, let's stretch our audience, let's stretch ourselves a little bit dealing with some, maybe a subject matter or language that we wouldn't normally do at a community theater. And we'd pick three plays because my theory was everything that you do on the first time, you're gonna make so many mistakes, you gotta go do two more times just to get it right. So we did that and that started the process for us. We rehearsed via Zoom until such time as we needed to get into the same space. And then for the first couple of weeks, we wore masks, um, face shields. We used a lot of face shields because we wanted to make sure we could see each other's faces. Um, off, this is an example of the director talking and meeting with the, the cast and the crews. Our casting was done um, by invitation uh, as a, rather than auditions. And um, so we did our casting, we, um, we started rehearsing and we realized, wait, something was missing. And so we actually realized after 95 years of doing theater for children, in addition to 100 years of doing theater for the community, we added the family show as well. And so we actually had to do a four show season, um, and which included three plays for adults and one play for children, which is done on Saturday mornings, all as a drive-in theater. So let me just share with you some photos that come from those experiences so you understand. This is what it sort of looked like when the audience is in place. Um, and you can see where the stage is. We actually have had people who thought we were doing drive-in theater where there was a screen. They were gonna come watch the movie. And we we're like, no, 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 this is actors on the stage. Um, this is the way some of the people are occupying their spots. We made sure the cars are well, great distance. We ask every group, obviously their own families can you know, take their masks off, but we ask when you're moving amongst groups or when you're heading towards the building, um, please don't wear a mask. I mean, excuse me, no, no, not don't. Please wear a mask. Um, we eliminated intermissions so there was no lines and um, we, you know, kept our, our building safe and we'll talk about that. And this is just, again, an example of what the audience is experiencing. A scene from our first play, The Love Letters, you notice the two chairs and tables. Um, this is what it kind of looked like from the um, audience's perspective. The actors only stood up, but they never got close to anything at all. 
This particular production, we actually cast three separate casts. So we could have a rotation cast. We also are giving ourselves some protection in case somebody got sick. We had a group ready to go in its place. It also turned out to be several people bought more than one show because they wanted to see all three casts. Um, so then we came back with rounding third, same basic structure. We changed the set a little bit. This was an example of two actors working together. Um, again, keeping distance. That's an extra long bench, six feet long, so that they had a measurement of how far apart they needed to always stay. Um, we, of course, included a rainstorm in the middle of it. No live rain, just communication. Uh, and we had a drinking fountain uh, so that they could do the scene. And finally, there was a sequence in the play that called for there to be a chokehold. They got into a wrestling match and to be a chokehold. Recognizing COVID-19 to keep our performers safe, we built and designed it differently. So they actually have the bench between them and a bat. I mean, it was very safe and, and comedic. It was not meant to be super threatening, but it was meant to make sure they maintained a distance from each other. And so then some scenes from Miss Electricity, our children's show, this takes place on in the mornings. Again, making sure everybody stayed at six feet apart as much as possible. Um, we had an interesting experience with this particular production in that one of our cast members had some health issues and was afraid might have contacted um, COVID. Um, and, and of course, at that point, everybody got on hold. Wit testing was took place. We brought an understudy in. Nobody had had contact for a week um, because of the way how we rehearsed the production. The understudy came in. The actress that had uh, potentially had COVID did not. Got tested and was clean and everything. It was related to other health issues. And so the show went on as scheduled. Um, and then finally, just another version, Roommate, the fourth one, a bit more of a complex set. Um, Again, to ladies, this particular production actually did involve kissing. Um, but out of uh, respect for COVID and out of respect for our performers, we actually did it more of a voiceover rather than the actual action taking place, um, which allowed, again, just to recognize some of the, the nuances that you do in the world of trying to keep your performers as safe as you keep your audiences. So again, just to help you understand a little bit, the way the process works is a person pulls up to a corner. We have um, an usher who shows them, assigns them a parking spot because parking spots were assigned by the height of your car. And on the day you showed up in case somebody didn't show up, we, we didn't worry ourselves about that. We also did not ask you to pay for it in advance. We, we did a donate what you can performance every night. And part of that was our quest for inclusivity. Um, so that we did not let price be an issue to keeping people away from sharing the experience. Somebody's there to park your car for you. Somebody was there to open the doors for you to go inside the building. And the, everything was um, taped off with the exception of one stall and one sink. And after every use, people would, uh, the cleaner would go in and wipe everything down to keep everything again safe and clean for our audience as much as for our performers. And then we offered concessions, again, individual wrappings. Everybody was, um, this particular shot was before she put her gloves on. Um, you know, we also used face shields, again, because we wanted to see smiles. This is what the audience looks like. And this is what our performers look like. Again, keeping everybody as safe as possible. And this is the, the drive-in um, theater experience, live drive-in theater. Um, it was a donate what you can. And although we came at this and said we were not concerned with income, we were not concerned with money, we had an incredible opportunity. Um, we developed a, a matching fund and we so exceeded every expectation we could have possibly hoped. This little summer season for us, generated almost as much as a straight play would have generated inside our theater. So we could not be happier with our experience. And that was live theater drive-in in Des Moines. David, thank you so much for sharing that. It was great to see how you kind of organized the space and how you kind of showed us the logistics and the mapping that you did for the live theater drive-in performances. So I really appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Travis Morgan, who is entering his fourth season as the CEO of the Sioux City Symphony Orchestra. This Nebraska native helped grow symphony ticket sales by 42% in his first year, and the symphony orchestra continues to grow with outside the box thinking. The orchestra's innovation has continued through the challenges of the pandemic, which I'm excited to hear about today. So Travis, I'll hand it off to you. Uh, first things first, I'd like to 
congratulate everybody. No one has used the word pivot today. So far, so that is the most refreshing thing I have heard all day long. Uh, outstanding, but great stuff by both the speakers before me. They extremely creative. Um, this past summer, um, I wrote up a five-year plan for the Sioux City Symphony Orchestra. And one of them was, we need more outreach in our community. We need to become a bigger part of our community. And by bigger part, I mean, we needed to connect with the people that come see us in concert or the people that live around us. We need our musicians who come from Sioux Falls, Vermilion, Sioux City, Omaha, Lincoln, um, Des Moines, all these different places. We need them to connect with the people here that support them in ways that we haven't done before. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 hits. And so instead of that five-year plan that I put together of, of forcing this upon everyone, um, I just hit the fast forward button and said, we're gonna do this right now. And what we came up with was, it was a program called Symphony for Siouxland. And we presented it to our, we had a town hall meeting with our orchestra through Zoom of course. And we presented them with this idea where, you know what, now's the time for us as an orchestra and members of this community to reach out to everyone in a way that we never have before. And that is provide them with content when everybody's home and people are dying for something live or dying for something new, looking for content, something to ease their mind or just make them feel at ease or give them some sense of normalcy, this is our chance to provide that for them. And when we presented it to our musicians this way, they were all on board immediately. I mean, we had 40 that said, absolutely, let's do this. And so we left it up to the, to, up to the musicians. They could do whatever they wanted um, and just you know, keep it to about 10 minutes or so or whatever, whatever you think is, is, is appropriate. So, what we did was we, we just made sure they, they taped it, they sent it to us, and what they played their favorite piece of music. Um, we had people get creative in a sense of, this is what I want to do for this. And so how we presented it was we gave it a big push on, on, on our social media platforms and our website. Um, I also had some, some friends in, in the media industry do stories on it before we started doing it. Um, we, we partnered with KTIV Channel 4, who actually did a nice 30 second commercial spot, which ran consistently throughout this time period, letting people know that on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at these certain times, you could log on to Facebook or onto our website or these different areas and see these brand new videos or even see them live. So um, when we started really getting the ball rolling on how we were going to present this, um, it was people do their own thing on video and we can do it two, one of two ways. We can do it live or we can tape it. And so we had a lot of people that wanted to tape things and that allowed us to get really creative with editing to make it fun and exciting. And that way people didn't have to do five takes, you know, with, with, and, and worry about doing it correctly the first time. Um, that, and then I was actually able to, once I got the video, was actually to do like a pop-up video um, with what they've given us. So when it was, um, let's say the French horn, okay? they started playing the French horn for their piece. And then I would put up interesting facts, crazy off the wall facts about the French horn and things that people never would have thought of. And it's something that people look at and like, I didn't know that there's 18 feet of, of tubing for a French horn, you know, whatever it is when you lay it out. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know that either until I started doing it. And so there's all kinds of these great things um, that really started to come out. And then about a, a week in or so, my neighbor over here, she goes, what you're doing is great. And she says, because, and here's why. Kids right now don't have access to band or to music lessons the way they did three weeks ago. Everybody's home now. Can you, is there something you can do? I'm like, that's a great idea. So we presented this, this chance for, let's give free lessons with this thing. And for all you folks out there that can think about this out loud, um, do you realize how much it would cost to have a one-on-one -on -one lesson with a concert master of an orchestra anywhere around? I mean, it's expensive. It, it, would, it would cost you an arm and a leg to have a one-on-one -on -one session. And these weren't one-on-ones, but they were as close as you were gonna get. And they were all free. And all the musicians were all about it. And so we, we went from having videos of fun things 
um, uh, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, there was a Bach to the Future um, event that we had that was, that was really great. Um, they played their favorite pieces. Uh, do-it-yourself videos on how to make home instruments, which kids loved. And uh, I'm sure parents are still cussing me about because of the blue issue on some of those, but you know, that, that's neither here nor there. Um, and the ball really started to roll. We, st we had people really starting to get involved and we had even grown-ups that were contacting us saying, okay, Travis, for real, if I get into the Zoom meeting on learn how to play the, play the violin, I'm not gonna be surrounded by a bunch of like nine-year-old kids. I'm, I'm like, no, it's for everybody. And so we had, grown adults that have always, look, they had nothing, that we, we, we had nothing but time, right? I mean, we all sat at home doing nothing, like, let's think of something, something to get creative with. So you had all these people that had nothing to do but just sit and try to develop ideas. You had people that were, I had a 75-year-old woman that, that was trying to learn how to play the violin one day because she always wanted to try. And bless her heart, here you go, here's your chance. So we had all these people doing these different activities that were trying and, and experiencing different things. And then you had kids that were yearning for that, that piece of music or that music class, or just even watching the videos every single day that we were posting, gave them an outlet that they, weren't, that they, could, that they couldn't get anymore from, from music class because they weren't in school. So there was these, this, this great movement that was really starting to, to go. And then, we started getting emails from our form, from guest artists that had played with us that cost thousands of dollars to bring in that said, love what you're doing. We want to get involved. How can I get involved? And so they started doing live concerts. We would, we would do a live concert with them. They'd set it up at 7 p.m. for everybody. And Mackenzie Melamed did an amazing show tunes piece. He did a Broadway show tunes piece on his piano in New York City in his home one night and he played nothing but Broadway tunes that we all know from Phantom of the, Phantom of the Opera to, I mean, you name it, he did it. And even took requests at the end. It was a fantastic event um, and it really, it, it drew people into us. Um, it connected us with our community because they were so thankful we were providing them with something that they were looking for at the right time. We had over 100,000 views in these, in these videos that we're taking in, well over 100,000. We grew our, our Facebook followers by over 800 people, started following us on Facebook. Um, that was a big, big help for us as well. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was a fun deal, but it's as creative as you wanted to get it, but you allowed the musicians to create the creativity, to be as creative as they wanted to be. And we opened up the door for them. And when you do that, you're going to get things that maybe are a little off the wall, but right now, guess what? It's off the wall and all bets are off and everything is thrown out the window. There are no rules right now. And so when you do that and you take the reins off, great things happen. And I think we really connected to our community. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is we did a drive-in movie theater. Um, we, we partnered with another group in, in town that was showing the Sandlot. And we actually went to the drive-in movie theater and our, our brass quintet played for 45 minutes before the drive-in movie happened on the drive-in movie stage. And we had mics and everything so everybody could hear them. Um, but that was also a, a very good experience. And um, it was allowing us to social distance and allowing our, our, our musicians to play. But I'm telling you, the Symphony for Sulan was a very big deal for us because it allowed us to connect in ways that we've never been able to connect before when we had the perfect opportunity to connect to them. And I think you'll see, I, I hope we see um, an increase in ticket sales this year if, if and when we play because we have connected with that community in, 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 a, in a better, deeper way and, and not so cold as we play, they go home, we go home, end of story. Um, there's a personal connection now. So um, it was very beneficial. And uh, I was guessed if you have any questions or anything along those lines, um, don't be afraid to reach out. We can definitely help you with, come up with some ideas. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Travis. Um, I really appreciated that you said that how artists are creative and to kind of just let them take the reins because I totally appreciate that they have the tools right now to solve our problems. They have the tools for healing and the tools to move forward. So I totally agree with you. Um, our final speaker for this session is Erica Overturf, founder of American Midwest Ballet, the region's professional ballet company. Under her leadership as artistic director and CEO, American Midwest Ballet enriches the area through an exciting array of professional dance performances, performances and a strong commitment to education and outreach programming. 
Erica's here to tell us about the innovative virtual dance programming that American Midwest Ballet coordinated this summer. Uh, Erica. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been so great to hear everyone's different solutions and how we get creative to keep our art form, uh, you know, alive during these different times. So, uh, you know, one, one thing that, that we've done that Travis was talking about that I think, you know, kind of relates to what we did is we took this opportunity to really draw on our artists and their experiences. And typically when you come to see a professional ballet performance, you're sitting in the audience watching live theater and nothing can really replicate the magic of that. You know, that's, that's a really amazing way for us all to connect. Um, but we thought, you know, we can share a different aspect of our art form during this time as well by giving a little bit more access and insight to the artists, what their work is, how they approach things and, and, and things like that. So we, uh, we were just, when the pandemic kind of struck, we were just uh, wrapping up our 10th anniversary season. So we said, well, you know, this is kind of a forced pause in a way of our normal performing, um, but let's take this as a little, as a time to stop and look back and like, what have we done in the last 10 years? And dancers, and we have 29 um, amazing professional dancers in the company. What are some of your favorite memories? So, you know, we asked all of them for several ideas and then we used their stories to create little interesting things that then we could share out with our audience. So it would combine, um, you know, uh, video interviews of them talking about, you know, oh, what, whatever it was, you know, some of the stories were more personal and some were more about the performance, but they got to share some insights and audience doesn't necessarily get to hear from the dancers in that way, but they find it, you know, really interesting to hear what goes on behind the scenes or what are they thinking when they're doing those things and what's the most challenging. And so we combined their interviews with uh, videos of them performing. And so it was also a way we could share out some of our repertory because we have this great, you know, history catalog of work that we've done for the last 10 years. And instead of just putting, you know, old performance clips up, we wanted to make, you know, make something new out of this. So photos, interviews, videos all combined together and share those out and just keep I mean, one of our goals has been to keep frequent engagement up too. So it's, it's funny during this time, I feel like we've actually done a way better job of engaging our supporters more frequently um, because we do have this different focus instead of us working in our own little, uh, you know, at the studios and out of view of the community and then coming together for this really exciting live event, we're able to kind of keep them in the loop uh, of, of our organization a lot more often because we are, I'm just sharing a lot more things virtually. Um, one of the other things that we, that we um, did right away was we had to, uh, you know, halt all in-person uh, classes. So rehearsals for the professional dancers, but we also have a school. And, you know, dance is especially tricky given the, the close quarters, uh, the long hours we spend together, physical exertion. Um, so social distancing is, is a pretty tricky uh, prospect with that. And so what we did is uh, we put the school on a break and kind of turned that into their spring break, but had uh, teachers come in on an individual basis and we recorded classes that we shared out. Uh, but we thought, well, hey, we're doing this. We didn't want to just share it with our students in the school. We wanted to make it available to everyone in the community because with so many families at home, this gives an opportunity, whether you're a dance student and you're missing you know, being with all of your friends and getting to dance and all of that. Or, you know, you're somebody that's never had the chance to go to dance class. You've been interested, but you've never made it in or whatever the case may be. So it's interesting. We had, you know, a lot of um, dance students participating in those recorded classes, as well as people that hadn't, that hadn't before. I talked to all sorts of people. And then I was uh, surprised. I actually, I loved hearing about uh, the project you guys are doing in Dubuque, that's where I'm from. So I found out that students in Dubuque were taking the classes, you know, and they, they knew about our company and, and everything. So it, it was interesting, you know, the idea we're used to being, you know, more, uh, things are more tied to a physical location, but it's sort of 
uh, opened up who can participate in some of the things that we're doing. So we, so we made a whole series of classes for students, but our school also does classes for adults. So we had adult classes on there. And I think even some of the people I talked to, you know, we even had board members that, you know, that don't come in and take class, but they were at home and they thought, oh, I can try this, you know? So, so it, was, it was neat to hear that um, more people maybe were able to participate um, through, through this new avenue. Um, Let's see, we also, we just moved into our brand new home at the Hoff Family Arts and Culture Center. I'd love to invite everybody, to, you have to come check it out. It's in Council Bluffs and it's so gorgeous. And we moved in in January. It's been a project that's been a long time, many, many years in the making. And then we just moved in. And then of course in, in March, we had to, uh, you know, close, the, <laughs> close that up for, for a while, but, um, but it's a beautiful facility and we were lucky that we get to have some grand opening events kind of um, in February before, before we had the whole pandemic situation um, affecting us. And so, but there were a lot of people that probably haven't gotten to experience the new Performing Arts Center. So we also made a virtual tour. We had one of our professional dancers that went in and uh, gave a whole tour, backstage tour, and let everybody see uh, all throughout the building and all of the wonderful things uh, that are, we're able to do in our new home with the new studios, the beautiful theater, and uh, it's really an incredible space. So we got to share uh, that with, with the community as well. Um, normally, at the end of the summer, we like to do a big day of dance. Uh, activity that just is a celebration of dance and offers free classes and activities for kids. And, uh, you know, uh, a, a big in-person event at the building was not in the cards this year. So we did make it a virtual event, but we were able to have it be live uh, with interaction from the teachers and dancers participating from home um, via Zoom. And we had activities for kids too as you know, dance related themes, but coloring activities and things like that. Um, so that we could still be bringing people together and they could even get that um, interaction with our teachers. So, um, so that was a successful event. And of course, you know, we'd love for it to be in person next time around, but in a sense, we didn't skip a beat. You know, we, we, we have, uh, but just been looking at like, what, what do we, normally do what's our passion what's our mission and how can we do that now under these you know these different um circumstances the dancers normally come back to work here um in the fall and so we're going to keep our company class virtual but we'll have our um accompanist our teacher our dancers all gathering together um virtually to take class so at least we'll be seeing each other continuing training and things like that. And then um, we also wanna keep working on new things. So we're gonna have the dancers working on uh, solo performances that again, we'll be able to make kind of unique films out of, share with the community, include some of that dancer insight. But I wanted to keep them involved with, um, you know, coming up with ideas of things that were inspiring them. So I really opened it up to them to say, what are you interested in working on? What would you like to do right now? And uh, for dancers, um, working on a, a solo is a great way to push yourself, grow artistically, give yourself technical challenge. So I think it'll be good for our dancers and it'll also continue to offer our audiences um, insight into our world. And hopefully we'll even create some new works and some interesting know um, new things out of this project so uh, that's a little bit of what we're up to awesome thank you so much Erica um, we obviously ran over time we got started a little bit late and then all of the projects were so innovative and you were covering so many good details that I just let them running let you guys run and talk with it um, so I don't actually see any questions in the q and I think we wrapped all of those up or answered them privately um, but I do know we're going to send out an attendee directory after the summit in an email on August 17th. So if you want to follow up with any of our presenters with questions, I'm sure they are 
more than willing to share more details about their projects and those logistics of those projects. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the summit.